Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the final presentations for the Texas A&M University version of Invent for the Planet. For those of you who have been following us online, Invent for the Planet has been going on throughout the globe throughout the weekend. We're at the tail end of this. It started in Vietnam and then went over to India and Pakistan and then to uh, Egypt. Uh, we had some teams from Uganda and Europe and South and North and South America. So we're at the tail end of this. The final presentation here will be made by 10 teams. We've had 10 teams here at Texas A&M University concentrating on solving some of the world's largest problems. As we like to say, for one weekend, there are no borders. For one weekend, there are no barriers. And for one weekend, there are only students solving problems around the world. So for one weekend, the sun will never set on innovation. My name is Rodney Bame. I'm responsible for engineering entrepreneurship here at Texas A&M University, and we're happy to be able to host this event. We've had over 60 students from many different areas concentrating and solving some of the world's biggest problems. You're in for a tremendous treat today. Let me give you an idea of what the format is all about. Each team will have 10 minutes to present, and then they'll have five minutes for questions from the judges. I'll allow the judges to introduce themselves in just a moment so that you see who are our judges. The winning team from Texas A&M University will then submit a 10-minute video of their presentation and they will then compete against the 30 plus other teams across the globe to be included in the final competition March 31st through April 2nd where we will have teams from around the globe join us here at Texas A&M University for the final competition. We're very excited about it. You're going to be very interested because the solutions that these students have been working on are truly awesome. So they'll have 10 minutes. Now for those of you in the room, students, here's something I do want you to do. As you know, we are participating in a research study. We're trying to understand how collaboration and teamwork works in this global environment. It's something that's not been studied before. We're going to ask you to fill out a survey. So after you finish your presentation and you breathe this sigh of relief, there's two things I want you to do. The first thing is I want you to go outside and we'll have a videographer out there. We're going to ask you to give a quick interview so that we can understand a little bit more about what you're doing. The second thing I want you to do, and this is individually, follow the link for the survey. Please fill out that survey. It allows us to gather the right statistical information so that we can help others replicate this experience worldwide. So those are two things that I'm really going to suggest and ask you to go out and do. We emailed you the link, and so you should be able to see both of those. Again, as I said, I'm Rodney Bain. We're responsible for engineering entrepreneurship. So I want all of you students also to consider taking your idea further. What we have is an incubator here at Texas A&M University, and we're ready to help you and support you and to be able to help you take this idea into solving global problems. Allow us to help you. Thank you very much for being here. Let's get excited and let's welcome our judges. Roland, I'm gonna start with you. So Roland Block, if, oh, you'll turn on your microphone, please, sir. Yeah. So, howdy, my name is Roland Block. I'm the Associate Director of the Career Center responsible for engineering. But the reason why I'm here is because of my professional career. I was a mechanical engineer, class of 92. Uh, did uh, product engineering, R&D project management, marketing product management, all the way to Director of Global Marketing for companies ranging from startup to Fortune 300, uh, all in the medical device industry, and I'm excited to help be a, a part of this fantastic event. Howdy, my name is Andrew West. Uh, graduated in 2016 uh, with a degree in petroleum engineering. Uh, and since I've worked at Accenture for the last four years, I've uh, been a part of Aggie's event um, as a moderator for several years now. Uh, I'm excited to, to be a judge this time. John. Howdy y'all, John Fry here. I'm the class of 84 and I am Hewlett Packard Enterprises senior technologist for IT efficiency and sustainability. I came to HPE 
through Compaq that became Hewlett Packard that became Hewlett Packard Enterprise, but before that was uh, engineer in sustainability and health and safety for uh, Boeing and NASA before that, and then did a short stint on the North Slope of Alaska as well. My undergrad's in safety engineering. I have a master in divinity and a doctorate in leadership, so I bring a variety of different perspectives then to uh, being here today, and I love to be with y'all. I think this is my fourth uh, invent for the planet, and I am just delighted to see what you come up with. Howdy. I'm Mark Johnson, class 78, retired Army colonel. Woo! Sorry. That's right. <laughs> We're classmates. Uh, I'm associate professor of practice in industrial distribution, and I also am the director of the professors of practice program for the College of Engineering. First off, I just want to congratulate each and every one of you regardless of how the results are, how you finish. Uh, the, map, the fact that you're here says a lot about you individually and collectively. Hopefully you've learned a lot about each other. You've enjoyed this effort. Good luck. All right, and teams, we're going to get started. There's a timer in the back. I'll keep you strictly to 10 minutes. If you get to zero, I will pull you off screen and also then have the judges have five minutes. I will also stop the judges from asking questions as well. So judges, don't get too long-winded because I'll shut you off as well. Thank you very much for being here. For those of you, we will have a, a break after the first five teams and then we'll come back again. The first team is City Seeds. Welcome aboard City Seeds. Downright apocalyptic images coming out of Australia right now. There are now six fires burning at emergency levels. Howdy, we are Team City Seats. My name is Amanda Gibbons and I am a master's student in biomedical engineering. I'm Matthew Holland, I'm a senior in mechanical engineering, minor in aerospace. I'm Kaushal Zushi, I'm a master's student in mechanical engineering. Hi, I'm Amir Gulkari, I'm a master's student, I'm studying industrial engineering. I'm Matthew Gan, I'm a master's student studying in computer science. I'm Beatrice, I'm junior in electrical engineering. Apocalyptic images coming out of Australia right now. There are now six fires burning at emergency levels. Scientists believe it's linked to record temperatures in the Indian Ocean. Global temperatures have risen about eight degrees Celsius over the last 139 years, and there are no signs it's slowing down. We know the impact of climate change in our lives. But did you know that carbon emissions from urban buildings is a major contributor to global warming? 68% of the world's population will live in urban areas by the year 2050. With densely populated cities come significant energy challenges, creating the necessity for advances in building management. But you can't just tear down buildings. 80% of existing buildings will still be in use by 2050. Today's technology can only increase energy efficiency by up to 20%. To match urban growth, we need a much more sustainable solution. Enter City Seeds. We provide building owners and city planners a sustainable building management solution. With rapid urban development, instead of working against nature, let's work with it. Using the same technology we've been using for thousands of years, the plants and footsteps. Using footprints to reduce our footprint, together, let's step towards a greener future. City Seeds. Plants powered by people. The problem that we're solving is reducing energy consumption and carbon emissions in existing buildings in urban areas. Nearly 70% of the global population will be living in urban areas by the year 2050. And this will make a dr drastic increase in the demand on energy usage. Additionally, 40% of energy consumption in the United States is caused by commercial buildings and 30% of this energy consumed is actually wasted. On a global scale, our solution targets four of the sustainable development goals outlined by the United Nations. For our design requirement, we focus on functionality, affordability, 
and maintenance frequency. For functionality, our product will reduce drastically air pollution, energy usage, and the utility bill. Uh, our product is also incredibly affordable. The customer should be able to break even within two years. For a maintenance period, it should not be more than once every three months. We started the design process by studying the problem and issues in the existing systems. We brainstormed and came with 10 different designs, ranging from implementing IoT devices, different sensors, and even machine learning. Using Pugues matrix, we shortlisted three top designs. The first design was to convert the kinetic energy of the footprints of the people into electricity. Use this electricity to power the lights in the building. However, the calculation so showed us that this electricity is not sufficient to power all the lights in the building. The second solution was to implement hydroponic plants, which will control temperature and humidity and reduce low run HVAC systems. However, these plants require eddy bulbs, which again consume a lot of power. The third design was to implement a solar power plant on the roofs and use solar energy to convert it into electricity. However, this solution was affected by variation in weather and comes with a lot of capex cost. Hence, we innovatively combined the first and second solution together. So this created a design where we took hydroponic plants in a certain bay and retrofit them to buildings. This uses the gray water that would otherwise be wasted in the buildings, as well as the natural light, which will also be supplemented by LEDs to supplement the sunlight that isn't there for the plants needed sunlight hours. So this is what it looks like when it's put into a building. I use the Houston skyline just because this is one of our primary target areas and it's also home for me. So plants will reduce the temperature inside a building by 10 degrees Fahrenheit during non-peak load hours and 20, up to 25 degrees Fahrenheit during peak working hours. This will reduce the load on the utilities by over 50% as has been proven by multiple independent studies dating back to 1980 in multiple different countries. It will also sorry, filter out different pathogens, pollutants, and allergens from the air to keep the people inside the buildings happier and healthier. So as I mentioned before, we'll use gray water that would otherwise be wasted inside the building. We'll have a central node computer control the amount of nutrients, pH levels, water amount, and other things that affect the environment around the plants to keep the plants happy and healthy because dead plants will just defeat the purpose of this whole project. And so this is what our flow looks like through our hydroponic system. You can actually see the prototype here that we tested. And so in order to supplement the sunlight that's not going to be there during normal daylight hours or during extensively cloudy or rainy times in the weather, we will use LEDs that simulate the sun's light. This will be powered by footsteps. It is an estimated five watts that comes from each footstep, and in the United States, it's estimated that about 4,000 people work in each building. This will be more than enough power to power these LEDs during times of deprived sunlight. Now, the people that have worked on this and brought it to fruition are called PaveGen. They have brought it to fruition across the whole entire world and have proven this concept and shown how it can reduce the load on the utility grid and have implemented it in anything from schools all the way to soccer stadiums. So for our market strategy, we plan on implementing that in three phases. The first phase will focus on Houston and LA. Specifically, we'll target the planning and development uh, organizations there. We've targeted this as phase one due to proximity and hot temperatures where our technology will really make a significant impact. Phase two will target a more national level in the US where it will work to provide tax incentives for commercial organizations and companies who will ideally implement this technology. And then finally, our phase three is on a global scale. We'll partner with organizations like UN and make um, investments with foreign entities such as ministries of urban growth and finance. We first perform a cost analysis on a prototype. The bill material, the cost, is estimated at around $135. We then scale it up. Look at around 900 square feet, which is the average space of the office building in the United States. We are looking at around $1,700. However, a third of the cost comes from the Pavigen energy harvester, meaning that it's gonna generate renewable energy in the future. Also, the plant itself can regulate the temperature in the building, meaning we have less AC running during a op uh, normal operation. And with that, we're looking at the saving 
of around a thousand and a hundred and forty five dollars on utilities. So we calculated the average utilities in the commercial space across the U.S. and we found that 25% uh, of the total utilities uh, is constituted by HVAC systems. And uh, as mentioned earlier, plants can reduce temperature by 10 to 25 degrees. And so in our calculations, we considered a reduction of 16 degrees Fahrenheit. And through that, we obtained a reduction of 50% in HVAC costs, and which is equivalent to the emissions of CO2 by an average household in the US. And this calculation does not consider photosynthesis during which plants absorb CO2. So if we consider that as well, then we get a reduction of 110,000 pounds of CO2, which is equivalent to emissions by 11 cars in the US per year. So for the next step, we're going to implement IoT device in planters so that we can uh, uh, constantly receive feedbacks from planters about the growth status of the plant. We then construct a central hub so that we can monitor all the plants throughout multiple buildings inside just one of the rooms that, re that re can reduce the maintenance. And next, we're going to apply machinery models. The models may be able to tell us how the status of the plants in the future so that we can, know, we can forecast if the plant is going to die or is going to survive. In conclusion, we've successfully established our business model using the business model canvas to identify target customers and provide them significant value. We ask that you invest in our company and help City Seeds take root and grow to provide a widespread solution towards sustainable business building management. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, judges, you have five minutes for questions. Remind you to use your microphones, please, sir. All right, I have a question for you. Uh, great job, fantastic presentation. Uh, you mentioned this is something that could be retrofitted into existing buildings. I was wondering if you could sort of describe how you envision that, particularly because you're talking about electricity from footsteps and then the plants I don't know if they're close by or how that's going to work with those two technologies trying to merge those together. So for plant propagation, uh, there are usually central nodes that propagate plants from stems and other parts of the plant. And so those are distributed across the nation uh, like they do with hardware stores, like they do with garden centers. And so this would just cause another node that these plants would have to travel to. And from there, you can put these plants in a canister or they can be delivered in a canister and all you have to do is switch out the canisters in the hydroponic system. And as for the um, retrofitting into a building, uh, gray water systems are already being implemented. So it would just be another system of uh, implementing gray water recycling in a building that's becoming more standardized as we go along in time here. And um, sorry, there was another part, oh, about the electricity. Sorry, and so PaveGen has already um, started retrofitting floors because there's a little bit of space in the floor that you have to work with and it fits within that space. And all you have to do is run wires to the central node to collect the energy. So you, you mentioned that um, the solution saved uh, operating expense for HVAC systems by about 50%, but at what point in scale are you able to actually save CapEx for air handling systems that don't need to be installed because of your solution? Did you guys look at where that break point was? Yes, um, so we analyzed the cost and the customer should take the maximum of two years to break even the cost because we um, estimate that a 10% in savings in bills monthly, and then we estimate our bill, our cost should not exceed 20% of the annual bill. So that's why it, the, the break point is two years. Yeah, good job. Uh, as I understand, so the, the cost to implement this go, is incurred by the building owner, yes. and then he or she is going to charge their tenants a portion or is it just going to be something that they're going to provide have you thought about that so we target office buildings so this should be something the owners pay for and then hopefully hope maybe because of the technology he'll be able to increase the rent and then hope get back the money from there we also hope, hope to provide a tax incentive by working with, with the government to make it more okay, more desirable for building owners to install this technology and the long term it's going to save money so yeah. there's incentive there to make a long-term investment to implement this technology one more is that uh, have you you know you talk about the tax incentives 
if you thought of other ways there to get government, uh, either state or local gov or, or federal government to provide incentives other ways? Um, so we talked about it briefly. One thing we're trying to do what Tesla was doing, which is when you purchase the car, the cost will be estimated on the website. So that's what we're planning forward. So y'all mentioned the Pavgen or, or Pavgen um, had a proof of concept. Was that purely for like the pedestrian, like kinetic energy? Um, and if it's more than that, what what is novel about um, your solution compared to what Pavgen's doing? So at the moment, they focus on public areas, outdoor. But if we license from them, we'll modify the engineering to make it fit inside office buildings. Also, we're gonna put the pavement, say, in front in uh, the front entrance or in the front uh, the, the area where the elevator is because there's where the majority of the area where people are going to walk across. I also think the majority of the novelty in our solution is going to be that currently there's no widespread solution to sustainable building management. So we're providing the combination of these two technologies in an innovative way to then you know, allow this to be a, a widespread solution to, to different building owners. OK, thank you very much, CC. <laughs> The next team is EBI. If y'all will come forward and City Seeds is going to take their hydroponic system out of here. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. All right, take it away, EBI. Howdy, my name is Jace Alvin, and I am a fourth year electrical engineering student. I'm Ashi Santorola, a first year biomedical engineering student. I'm Kenneth Munsan, a fourth year student in electrical engineering. I'm Faith Gonzalez, I'm a third year manufacturing and mechanical engineering technology student. I'm Jessica Samaripa, a fourth year electrical engineering student. And I'm Lauren Herrera, a first year student studying aerospace engineering, and we are fire be extinguished before ignite, sorry. How many of you like animals in here? Your pets? Yeah, I like animals. But what would you think if your animals looked like this? Wildfires are devastating not only the people, but also the environment and wildlife habitats. One of the biggest concerns, wildlife caught in the fire's path. The American firefighters arriving to help in Australia. Maria fire exploding in size overnight, scorching 5,000 acres, forcing thousands of families to evacuate. Tonight, a statewide emergency in California and two new fires igniting near the Carquinez Bridge northeast of San Francisco. Right now, the Amazon rainforest is being consumed by fire. Of course, known as the lungs of the world, it provides 20% of the oxygen for the entire planet. At EBI, we specialize in developing new innovative solutions to prevent wildfires. Our comprehensive three-stage system is specifically designed to mitigate the threat posed by these natural disasters. Stage 1. Satellite imagery is gathered from a wide array of units for potentially hazardous hot zones to be easily identified and isolated. Stage 2. The data is transferred to a software database to display the locations to the users. Stage 3. A UAV is sent to the designated zone to provide precision surveillance. In severe cases, the drone has the ability to deploy eco-friendly countermeasures to suppress or put out flames. Join us as we strive towards a healthier future for our environment. Extinguish before ignite. All right, well, thank you guys for coming out. 
We are so excited to share all of our ideas with you guys today. We are EBI, and our mission is to prevent wildfires by first identifying dangerous spots called hot zones in which these wildfires may occur, and then removing the threat. And here is our requirement. First, our device, our solution has to be able to alert when the area becomes risky or the hotspot becomes greater than 35 degrees Celsius. And the second is have to prevent fire from spreading out more than 5 meters square. Third is have to be able to operate in any kind of weather. And fourth is have to be able to operate multiple times a day. And the last one is have to be able to integrate with satellite data. These are the designs we considered. The first one would be a cabinet that would be placed in many different locations in a forest. Drones would be in these cabinets and these drones would go out and scan the forest for hotspots. We didn't choose this one because of the, uh, the maintenance and the cost that would require for so many drones. The second idea we had was a blimp. This blimp would be tethered to the ground and would also locate the hotspots. This one would interfere with uh, regular air traffic control, so we didn't choose that one. The one we did choose was a UAV and satellite combo. Our solution uses satellites and it gets the data and puts them into an app. This app then locates the most uh, hotspot a susceptible area and it puts it into a coordinate which it sends to the UAV. The UAV then goes to this coordinate and it disperses of the fire retardant. So we use five satellites. Uh, four of these are owned by NASA and the other one is by Digital Globe. The four owned by NASA are actually going to be used to track hot spots as well as vegetation and if there is a fire already ignited it will show a size of smoke and carbon monoxide. So as we were all preparing and uh, doing final tweaks in the morning, NASA satellites were actually going around the Earth and finding hot spots, which you can see on the image to your right. Those little rots, uh, right, red spots sorry, are the ones that are actually hot spots that the Earth has right now. So this is the kind of data that would come into our app. So our app would take fi the five images that the satellites take and put them in a single display. And this display, it would be a coordinate system so that a coordinate could actually be found as to where the hotspots are. Uh, when the coordinate is sent to the UAV and it goes to complete its mission, the app continues on and it sends an alert out to local authorities as to which areas are right now considered a potentially hotspot uh, warning areas so that they can uh, monitor these locations so that the uh, so that they're always uh, making sure that they're on top of it and not uh, and not behind. <laughs> and another part of our app is this display. So this is kind of what our app would look like. And the white fires show the least severe hotspot zones, and the red fires show the most severe hotspot zones, so that they can so that they can see where their resources need to be allocated to, but uh, which areas still need to be monitored. So as for the subsystems that our device will contain, we will be using a UAV autonomous vehicle in order to accomplish these goals that we have set for ourselves. We will be incorporating a radio frequency uh, receiver and transmitter in order to receive and transmit signals coming from the satellite, as well as informing uh, the residents and uh, authorities of these uh, hotspots areas. In addition, we will incorporate sensors. The following sensors that we will incorporate in our design include a thermal camera. This thermal camera will allow us to track and collect thermal images as presented in the image to your left. In addition to that, we will also be using a LiDAR sensor in order to map out the forest floors to give us a more precise and better understanding of what type of environment we'll be working in. And lastly, we'll be incorporating a GPS sensor in order to give the UAV coordinates to tell it where exactly it needs to be. In addition to that, we have area for our payload for our fire resistant uh, fertilization. So we choose to do an environmentally friendly fire retardant. This will actually be thrown on top of the hot zones before actual fires happen. We will be doing this uh, every three to six months. This fire retardant that we chose to use is actually under development here at Texas a &M. It's a water-based uh, fire retardant that has clay and plants in it, so it tends to be um, eco-friendly towards animals and plants. And here is...
and that the simulation that's going to show how exactly our model is going to be in real life. So, in comparison to other pre-existing products in the marketplace as of now, we presented to you in a table to show some of the benefits that our product has against the competition. You can see that our product is customizable, so we not only can embed the system into UAVs, but we can also embed it into other types of aircrafts or air vehicles. In addition, it's also mobile. It allows for mobile communication to residents and first responders. And lastly, we also have the ability to produce this at a much more cost efficient uh, to supply to areas that are in need of this. So the model we're using for our UAV drone is called the MQ-4 Reaper. It is a multi-functioning drone that's being currently used by the US military. But the, in the United States, there are plans to fully integrate it within local governments by 2025. Uh, the, we overestimated the numbers a little bit for ease of calculation, but a unit price would be around $22 million. And hypothetically, if you sold each unit at $35 million, by the time you sold three, you would have doubled your profit margin. Uh, I know that looks like a lot up front, but just to use Australia as an example, a single wildfire, the smoke from in Sydney could cost them up to $33 million in a day. And last year from October to December, they spent around $165 million in insurance claims. And in 2018, they spent over $2.5 billion trying to fight existing fires. So when you compare the cost of our research to the amount of money they're spending currently, it's a lot cheaper. So we are hoping to sell this to both undeveloped and developed countries. This can um, be adapted to specific trades, we work in any country in the world. It can create a global alliance, and it's cheaper, just as Jay said. It can create a global alliance through the UAVs can be lent out to different countries who don't have them. Before we end the presentation today, I would like to thank everyone here that's inspiring us to solve this world problem. Remember this, with EBI, we can stop the wildfire, we can make a world better, and we can save this animal. Thank you All so right, much. All right, Eco, thank you very much, EBI. <laughs> Judges, you have five minutes for questions. All right, very good presentation, thank you. Uh, I have a question. For the, the dollars that you showed, there were, I believe, three uh, uh, drones that were included. Mm -hmm. What what type of calculation did you do for the number of drones versus the area that they would have to cover? Because you look at Australia and different areas in the US and those are very large expanses. So I was wondering what that ratio would be. Okay, so we looked at the uh, price of a gallon of the fire retardant first in general use. Uh, one gallon covers around uh, four. Yeah, 400 square feet, sorry about that. And um, we can fit about 305 gallons into one single UAV drone based on our calculations of uh, the maximum amount of payload that the drone can carry. So that would be so one drone could uh, cover about 122,000 square feet of area. And then for the area that you're trying to protect, how many drones would be needed for, let's say, you, you showed Australia about, do you know about how many drones that would require? Um, for the logistics, we were thinking that because the local governments probably know better than we do. So we are more providing the services for them, and then logistically they would operate within their means to see what would be the best plan of action for them. And the way our app works, it kind of narrows down at, like the location so that they're not spreading it over like every single place. They're spreading it over um, the land that needs it right now so that once that is taken care of and another place uh, like becomes at risk, we could still, like they had time to allocate more resources to that area. If you thought about, do the high cost, if, if I have to buy the whole package, I the UAV and the system, to make it maybe more plausible for some of the smaller companies that they could retrofit your system onto their existing UAV, so they wouldn't have to buy the UAV, but they could still utilize your system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could, yeah, for sure. So um, actually one of the topics that we were uh, brainstorming about was that uh, we would sell the system and the app. So we would provide sensors and uh, the LiDAR system for the for like planes that the underdeveloped countries already had that would connect to our app so that they could still do the same things 
if they couldn't afford the UAV, but the UAV was more of like a overestimate because it's more of like the optimal system because it already has all the sensors that they need. So that's why we presented it in that way. Okay, and the other is like say, you're not coming in to fight the fires with your capabilities. You're intending to sell this capability to a country that's already fighting the fire to enhance their capabilities, is that? Yeah, so okay. what we're trying to do is, because they're allocating so much money, like right now, um, Australia, over its uh, span of about seven bushfires, they've spent around $100 billion. That's a lot of money. So what we're doing is we're helping them limit the money that they're spending so that they can, it, it's more affordable and it's preventing it before a fire comes to the point where they have to prevent the fire, rebuild the city, redo their entire structure over and over again, because that's what they've been doing for the last 200 years. So we're more likely, we're more uh, looking to prevent the fire before it becomes that big. I'm curious, um, the thought around having an app, it looked like a, a mobile app was represented. Um, so I think at some point you mentioned it was not only for fire response, but also for like residents. Um, is the intent that the, the general public would also have access to the app? And then if they did, is it just there to alert them that a fire is nearby? So, so yeah. the app is actually, so local authorities when we want to control like where the UAVs are at, it's more for the purpose for the public, is more for them to know if they're in a dangerous area, um, how severe the area is, if they need to be started to evacuate before they, like, stuff, stuff got some fire and they're stuck in the middle of a danger zone. So, like, the software would be more, like, for the authorities to use, and if there are residents in, like, potential danger areas, they would send out the alerts to those residents. So they're more like Amber Alerts, yeah. kind of. So one thing I didn't hear you guys mention was uh, resupply once the uh, UAV has dropped its first load of fire return. Um, a lot of the aircraft-based systems can reload while moving or while still flying. Um, do you have a way to reload while it's still moving, or do you have to come back to a landing strip, reload the retardant, and go off again? Uh, currently, they would come back and land, and then we would reload the retardant. But uh, currently, um, our threat level estimates is if the hot zone is greater than around 50 square feet, we would drop the retardant. So like it wouldn't be dropping the entire retardant in one go, because it can carry around like 1,500 square feet. Okay, thank you, EBI. Appreciate it. The next team is Aeroscannable. And yeah, clicker, thank you. Let's hear from Aerostainable. Howdy. 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 I'm Andrew. I'm a junior in mechanical engineering. Hi, I'm Bella, and I'm a freshman in general engineering. I'm Nick. I'm a freshman in general engineering. I'm Emma. I'm also another freshman in general engineering. I'm John. I'm a junior in aerospace engineering. And we are Aerostainable. Every year. 5.7 million tons of waste is created by airline passengers and it's predicted to double by 2023. Of that waste, almost 30% of it is contributed to food waste, which means 1.7 million tons of food is wasted annually from air travel. To get a better picture, that's enough food to fill four and a half Empire State Buildings, or enough food to feed 2.5 million people every year with the amount of food that's being thrown away on airplanes. Uneaten food is the largest source of trash in U.S. landfills and accounts for 18% of the country's methane pollution. In air travel, the main causes of mass amounts of food being discarded are the broad statistical predictions airlines make about the quantity and type of food their passengers will eat, the lack of incentives to make a change, and airlines choosing convenience over being conscious of the future. That's why we created Aerostainable. 
Airstainable is a website interface that international airlines can use so passengers can personalize their meals in advance, resulting in precise calculations of the amount of food needed per flight and dramatically reducing food waste. This interface is combined with an efficient distribution system for the food that lowers costs and saves time, resulting in more profit, more choice, and most importantly, more sustainable solutions. Using Airstainable, me, you, and everyone has the opportunity to make a global difference. We are here to reduce food waste produced by the airlines. For the past 48 hours, our team uh, came up with several alternative solutions to tackle the problem. Automated beverage dispenser, compostable dishware, and vacuum dishwasher with bento boxes were considered to eliminate cans and plastic waste. We have also came up with automated waste sorter to facilitate recycling in the cabin. Surprisingly, these, we have found out that these solutions already do exist, but they're not being implemented because they're not profitable enough for the airlines. Then we reviewed our design requirements. Our re design requirements include at least 5% reduction in food waste, no additional task for flight attendants, no extra space, weight and power consumption required for the aircraft. And then we came up with a great solution. All right, now first before we give y'all the solution, um, I just want to ask y'all a few questions. How many in here would consider yourself a picky eater or know any picky eaters? How many in here have dietary restrictions or know anyone with dietary restrictions? Lastly, how many people have ever been on an international flight and have ordered a meal and not finished it? As previously mentioned, 1.7 million tons of food is being wasted annually, and it's only expected to go up from now. Some airlines even um, predict and produce three meals per first class passenger um, when they only eat one meal which ends up a lot of food being thrown away. With wasted food being the biggest um, contributor to overall waste from airplanes, we decided action needed to be taken. That's why we came up with Airstainable. Airstainable is a website interface that um, encompasses personalized food ordering, order fulfillment and catering, and an in-air manual assembly instructions to eliminate food waste. Here's the website component of our solution. After selecting your seat when purchasing a plane ticket, Aerostainable allows any airline company to implement a portion of their website in which the customer can choose what meal they would like quickly and with ease. Here's an example of it in action. By allowing customers to choose what they would like to eat before getting on the plane, food, waste that, food that would be wasted is never even made at an on-the-ground catering facility. And if a trust customer changes their mind, we send a confirmation email about a week before the flight to update any preferences before takeoff. After the data is recorded down in the system, we use a lean manufacturing model for the rest of the process for the food. First, the data is sent to the catering facilities where at the end of cooking the food, the caterers place it in the trolley cart and sort it organized by seat. Then, the trolley carts are loaded onto the aircraft. Once the carts are loaded onto the aircraft, the flight attendants will take out the entrees and cook them just like they're doing right now. And once they are done cooking, they will sort them back into the trolley cart and they will double check the work of the catering company using the interface that is in the galley, shown here. This interface allows them to clearly see what food is required for each passenger in which seat. Although this requires a little bit more time spent in the galley, it will save time because they will not have to go through the entire aircraft taking everyone's orders. The result of the aerostainable process is more choice, more profits, and more sustainability. Through online food ordering, we give passengers the opportunity to get exactly what they want and eliminate annoying disturbances on the flight from food ordering on long flights. Airlines currently spend about $6 per passenger just on food. Through our process, we can eliminate unneeded food choices and reduce that number, ultimately saving airlines over $250,000 
per day. Considering training costs and display integration, we predict that we can reach profitability within two weeks of full-scale implementation. Not only do we help airlines realize profits, but we also benefit catering services by providing data optimization so that they can optimize their food preparation service as well as lower bulk food orders and ultimately save costs. Finally, we can reduce the environmental footprint of the entire airline industry by cutting excess food and related, related packaging by over 20%. After our solution is implemented, these are the next steps we'd like to take. The first one is AI optimization, which will allow us to take the data that is being recorded from the online orders and better predict which food customers prefer for certain flights, certain times of day, certain meals, and save money for the catering company and the airlines in the long run. Within two months, we would like to implement personal preference profiles, which allows users to imp input what types of meals they like and any dietary restrictions, like being vegetarian or vegan. And then after about three months, we want to definitely accommodate standby passengers so that when they buy their tickets last minute, they can still get a personalized meal on their flight. We are Aerostainable. Thank you very much for listening. If you do have any questions, please. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Have you thought about the economies of scale for both the cater and the airline in terms of, you know, normally I, I do two types of meals so I can go to them now. I'm, I'm, I'm adding more choices, which is good for the customer, but potentially uh, just, again, make it more challenging for uh, that caterer. Yeah, so we actually aren't necessarily adding that many more choices. We're just letting people choose in advance what they would like so that um, you don't have to, the flight attendants don't have to ask you during the flight. And then also, so when data is sent to these catering facilities, um, that they can, everything in the catering facilities is handmade. And um, honestly, big scale looking at it, it wouldn't add that much more time and it would save a lot more money in the long run. Kind of what you were talking about, if you thought, thought about, most airlines already have a frequent flyer plan. Right. And this would just be another thing that you could add, uh, and, and the, that's not gonna be all of your passengers, it'll be a significant number, certainly for certain uh, flights, uh, majority will be those there. So that would help you start to identify that early. And that's already sourced, so it's not like you gotta create another web page or another data source. Yes, so this web, web page would definitely just be added on to these airlines' um, web pages or apps that they already have. Okay. Right. Yes. So uh, a couple other benefits I see is uh, one is less weight equals less fuel that it takes to exactly. move aircraft in the sky. Uh, but also, um, if you've ever been that passenger that they get back offering choices and then they say, we don't have any more choice, this is what you're going to eat. Yeah. So are there opportunities then, given that there are other benefits for the airline in terms of uh, passenger satisfaction and fuel savings, in terms of a business model where you would profit share, for example, right. with the airline and keep some portion of the savings you drive? Well, definitely, um, since obviously you can see in one day an airline would save $250,000, it would definitely be cool to give back to the um, give back to the customers and even in start making the foods nicer or including more options. I think overall the profits, the extra profits made, would be best given back to the consumer and back to the airlines to continue implementing our solution and also implement it into better machine learning um, techniques and statistics to further improve the software. I had a quick question. Uh, I believe I heard somewhere that profitability within two weeks was something that somebody had mentioned. Could you describe who the who that profitability would be in, within two weeks for your organization or for the airlines that it's, would be implementing? It's for the airlines. We estimate that each meal weighs about 500 to 600 grams, and when we send out a survey to participants in this competition, <laughs> faculty, friends, and family, we received data back and did calculations on these numbers and when running the reduced amount of food that would be distributed on the flight, 
we realized that they'd be saving a lot of money and the returns would be made back very quickly because a lot of food is wasted. And if it's not made in the first place, then you're saving money when you're buying from the catering company and it just flows from there. And then are you anticipating creating a catering company or is this model something that you're going to propose to catering companies? I'm just curious. It's the model we are proposing to the pre-existing catering company. Yes. We would work with both the catering companies, companies and the airlines uh, overall. And it works to benefit both the airlines and the catering companies because the airline makes money if they don't have to waste any food and the catering company makes money by not ordering excess food and having a lot of inventory. So it benefits both. And uh, with regards to $250,000 per day, so we acquired the data from this, uh, from the data set that we had a little survey about. And the calculation was on the safer side. So we had, for example, if we had 25% of the reduction, then we calculated with 20% of the reduction, then we got the, then we extra extrapolated the data and that, that's the number we were giving, giving out to you. There's time for one more short question. Now the question and statement is three, uh, three of you are general engineering. That's impressive uh, that you've got that many underclassmen. So good job. Thanks thank you very you. much. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're understandable. The next team is Ecotory. Oh, thank you. side is the slower side. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ecotory, take it away. Howdy. 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 My name is Emily Gonzalez. I'm a senior biomedical engineering major. Howdy. My name is Teresa Valdez, and I'm a junior computer engineering major. Howdy. My name is Ryu Q. I am a junior computer engineer. Howdy. My name is Sven Wilson. I'm a junior mechanical engineer. Noble Gutierrez, sophomore mechanical engineering major. Hi, my name is Claire Gregoire, and I'm a PhD in mechanical engineering. And we are Ecotory! <laughs> Ten billion pounds. Ten billion pounds of waste were produced last year by airline passengers, which will nearly double by 2030. Do you know what happens to your waste once you reach your destination? It is accumulated in landfills or incinerated, both of which waste resources and contribute to climate change. Over 73% of airline waste stems directly from excess food and packaging materials simply because airlines are unable to gauge passengers' needs prior to the flight resulting in overstocking. What if we told you that we could significantly reduce this amount of waste? Welcome to Ecotory, the world's first sustainable inventory system that allows passengers to directly participate in minimizing in-flight waste. Our environmentally conscious application programming interface allows passengers to exchange unwanted meals or amenity kits for airline miles. This provides individualized experiences for each passenger while also encouraging waste reduction. Ecotory drastically reduces the weight on board the aircraft, which saves millions of dollars in fuel consumption. Our system offers a webhook that allows airline carriers to seamlessly integrate their existing database systems with our API. Take flight with Ecotory and enjoy a sustainable inventory. The 
problem we are solving is excessive waste produced by airline passengers. Now this is a problem because it takes up space on the airplanes, which increases fuel costs, and in order to decompose this waste, it produces greenhouse gases which contribute to global warming. We are also focusing on international flights and long domestic flights, where the passengers will usually have multiple options as to what meals and amenities they want. This table relates the amount of waste produced to the amount of carbon dioxide released. In 2016, it was calculated that 10 billion pounds of waste was produced across the world by airline passengers, and this resulted in almost 20 billion pounds of carbon dioxide being released. These numbers are expected to double by 2030. The majority of waste is coming from food, paper, and plastic wrappings. Currently, airlines use statistical data that provides them with a set number of meals and amenities they should pack for each flight for a certain number of passengers. However, this is a problem because not every passenger will want everything that is packed for them. This creates wasted materials. The following are the five design requirements that my team and I collectively decided on to go ahead and narrow it down to our final solution. These requirements are needs to reduce airline waste by a minimum of 30%, does not depend on changing of local or federal laws, does not increase workload or time for flight attendants, must be at minimum net zero cost for the airline, and must be implementable to more than one um, car carrier. So much like our first two designs, there is many ideas out there that do allow the airlines to be eco-friendly. However, these ideas do cause there to be changes in the structure of the aircraft as well as it does give more workload onto the flight attendants and it gives them more stuff to do while they're um, in, air, in the air. So we decided to go ahead and implement an API program to manage inventory more effectively. This is a solution to go ahead and allow the airline to be more proactive um, and allow for it to reduce the waste from the stores. So introducing our application programming interface, it plugs into the individual airline database and, and this allows her to reduce the waste by allowing pre-selection of airline amenities for individuals when booking flights. Hugh will go ahead and walk you through what our API works. Hi, I'm Hugh. Let's take a closer look. This is the home page. I'm going to start with the food selection. Here's the pop-up remind. To be eco-friendly, my flight provides two meals, and I'm only going to select one meal. By doing this, it brings me 100 bonus miles. And do I have a restriction for the food? Yes, I'm going to require vegetarian food, and I am Asian vegetarian. There's more options for selection. And if there's any beverage I would prefer, I am going to select tomato juice. And there's another pop-up just reminding me about the reward program. And there's any amenities, do I prefer? Yes, I'm going to choose blanket. Here we go. We got us summaries of the items I selected. This is wonderful. By doing this selection, I get to have 200 miles reward. And how does this solve the problems? By using this API, it can replace the statistical assumption with the actual data to access the needs. Also, it pack less necessary item on the fly, avoid overloading the plane reduce the final waste to be treated afterwards. Our API is designed to hook into these primary databases for the airlines. We're gonna use ticketing information and flight information to figure out what class the passenger is and take what pre and load those preferences in a pre-generated template which will go to the passengers. After the passengers fill that template out, the data will go into a statistical database for airlines to use to better analyze user uh, usage statistics, as well as be uploaded to the manifest data at least 24 hours before the flight to ensure your preferences make it on the plane. Flying is scary because it is the one place where you're thousands of feet above the air in a metal canister with no control whatsoever of what's going to happen to you. So it makes sense that airline, uh, airlines want to increase the customer experience by giving passengers more control and making them feel more comfortable. And that's exactly what Ecotori does. Even small changes uh, to reductions to bringing things onto a plane in either amenities or fuel, uh, food costs can bring massive savings to the airline. United predicted that they could save over $300,000 by reducing the, the weight of their in-flight magazine by one ounce. 
American Airlines saved 40,000 by removing a single olive per year from their salads, from every single salad served. Just imagine how much a 16 ounce meal would save if that didn't have to make it onto the plane. We calculated it, it's $4.8 million per meal over an entire year. In addition, we're not just a pretty interface, we also do background statistics and help, man help airlines manage their inventories better. We understand that there are certain areas with catering system and airlines that make it hard for airlines to customize exactly what items, and we want to help airlines encourage consumers to make themselves more comfortable and use the options that are available more readily. For our financial impact, we're going to engage in a five-year contract with airliners with a, where we charge them $7,000 of annual cost. This cost is based on the distribution of our efforts in, in providing our services. We're going to target large international airliners such as United because they produce the most in-flight waste globally. As we mentioned, Ecotory provides customer incentives. So when a user chooses to forego certain products such as a meal or certain amenities like headphones or blankets, they're provided they're rewarded with free airline miles, which gives them the choice to minimize their waste and reduce their carbon footprint. We were able to get in contact with a Southwest business consultant who supported the revolutionary idea of rewarding reduction in waste directly chosen by passengers with airline miles. Now, for example, Southwest offers business passengers free alcoholic beverages. However, most of those business passengers chose to decline that because they had to be ready for a business presentation as soon as they landed. So this resulted in an overstocking of alcoholic products, which, reduced, which increased the weight on the plane and resulted in more waste. Furthermore, airlines are only, only use a fraction of a cent to offer airline miles per mile flown. So this is a mutually beneficial rewards program that encourages passengers to reduce their waste in exchange for airline miles. So now let's emphasize our project innovations. This project can be implemented into any airline database. Second, the service, the pre-selection services are extremely limited or not offered at all in the market right now. Third, the role of the passengers right now, we are giving them a unique way to participate. And finally, we can considerably cut down on excessive waste working directly on the source of the products we've raised. Thank you very much, Eco Tori. It's now time for judges' questions. You have five minutes. Did you primarily look only at American flag carriers for this? The reason I ask is because many of the Asian and Middle Eastern based air, uh, airlines put a lot more emphasis on the amenities and that as opposed to the U.S. carrier base. So that's you know, U.S. carriers, I think, will probably eat this up, but some of the other ones there might, might be a little more pro problematic with their business plan. So, again, is this primarily focused on U.S. flag carriers? Right now, that's what we're targeting. Uh, there is one of the things that we were looking at, one of the trends is, uh, it's a Swedish word called flikska. Uh, it means encouraging Europeans not to fly because how um, how much waste it produces, and we're seeing that as if this moment, if this kind of revolution takes up more ground, then it, a lot of carriers, even foreign, are going to see their sales drop, and they will start looking for options, and we will be ready to serve their needs whenever they will come to us. One of your objectives was to reduce something by 30 percent in the the start. Uh, could you tell us? what your actual projections were for this technology for the airlines. Did you meet that objective? So the reason why we got 30% number is what one of the research statistics that we found is that 30% of the, um, of the food waste that was coming out was actually unopened meals, so that's just excess. And by using our system, at minimum, we wanna bring that number close to zero, if not completely down to zero. And that's not including all the plastic waste that f uh, follows all, those uneaten, all that uneaten food. And then uh, you had mentioned Southwest. Uh, is their flight model a little more challenging for this since people just sort of run in and get the first available seat? Is that something that you're able to do? Or uh, I think you'd mentioned longer international flights where that's typically not the case. 
That's exactly right. So we're going to target more international flight carriers because they produce the most in-flight waste and they offer a lot more amenities and meals uh, rather than domestic flights. You know, I'm kind of curious from a scale perspective, what other hospitality industries out there could benefit from this same solution? So, if, can you go back one? Yeah. So in our future options, we're looking at hotels and also train industries, anywhere really where you can bring on food. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that we are using an interface that can be adapted to other industries to not only like do the aviation. So the project was about that, but we, we think that in future directions, we need to be more open-minded too. Um, so as a traveling consultant, um, this is kind of cool. Getting rewarded uh, with more points is, is always um, something we're looking for. Um, I'm curious if y'all thought through, um, so if I get 100 points for not taking that bottle of water, for instance, or, or really it's that small little cup of water, I might be more incentivized to go purchase like a big gulp or something, you know, in the uh, in the terminal before I get on the plane. Did y'all think through what the the alternative might be if, if someone's not incentivized to take the smaller amount that's offered on the plane? We actually want to kind of encourage that. So if you don't choose your meal, because one of the biggest problems with airline food, everyone hates airline food. It doesn't taste right. Airlines are always working around to figure out what's the best way they can balance cost versus quality. When you bring food from home, you're not worried about that. You worry about more about what you are interested in, uh, what you're interested food-wise. And you know, of course, that brings up a weight consideration, but one of the things is bring airlines providing food or providing those beverages on their own, they have to factor that into their weight calculations. Anything you bring on is already calculated into your carry-on. The, the airlines already have to set a standard for that, so they're not, they're not having to, there's no fuel reduction if you bring or don't bring your sandwich, if that makes sense. And to add on that, to expand again, like, we can even use the same example for blankets. The people can use and bring their own blankets. It seems like to be like still the same weight. Well, if we don't do progress on the weight, then we are doing the progress on the wrapping package because for safety reasons and security, they have to package everything for like disease and everything like propagating, right? So it's not only food here also. Okay, thank you very much, judges. Thank you very much, Ikatori. The next team is, I believe I'm saying this right, Zoifus, is that correct? Okay, y'all y'all get a chance to, to, to uh, talk about it. You're gonna need a table, is that correct? Howdy everyone, how are y'all doing today? Good, good, good. good. All right. Nice to hear. Um, just bear with us, I know we are the last presentation right before break, but I promise you won't be disappointed in what you hear. So I'm Jesse Phipps, I'm a junior biomedical engineer. My name is Hudson, I'm a junior civil engineer. My name is Rohit Amaravadi, I'm a freshman general engineer. Hi, my name is Jonathan Rodriguez, I'm an electronic systems engineering student. Hi, I'm Anak, and I'm a, a junior electrical engineer. Hi, I'm Nikhil, and I'm a mechanical engineering graduate student. And we are Zoe Falls. And I was almost home, and next thing you know, the little boy's right in front of me. Pedestrians staring at their smartphones while walking, even crossing the street, are a hazard to themselves and others. Pedestrians crossing roadways without paying sufficient attention to their surroundings is a major issue today. Since the smartphone wave of the early 2010s, the number of accidents involving distracted pedestrians has been rising considerably. Of the recorded events, three quarters of pedestrian fatalities were not at crosswalks or intersections, and three quarters were in the dark. But how can we mitigate these accidents? Zoifos, a name derived from the Greek words for life and light, 
shines the way to making the road safer for both pedestrians and drivers. By sensing the movement of a pedestrian, the system can illuminate lights embedded in the sidewalk to alert a driver of a possible danger to themselves or to others. The system can also detect the position of cars on the road to warn pedestrians of an approaching vehicle, activating lights ahead of the car's current position. Zoifos is an affordable option for arming the roads with the means to protect its users. Join us in lighting the way to a safer environment for everyone. And so again, we are Zoifos, and we are reducing the number of injuries caused by pedestrian unawareness. Now these tragedies have drastically increased since the early 2010s. 76% of fatalities are in the dark and 74 are not at crosswalks. And so we wanted to implement a solution to help work with cities to mitigate these tragedies. So what we wanted out of our solution is we wanted it to be scalable. We needed it to work for two and four lane roads. We want it to not interfere with current road requirements to make it easier to work with cities. And we needed it to be cost effective. And this is so it can be implemented in all countries. It needs to pertain to a high user base and work in varying temperatures. Two of the solutions that we proposed, one was a smart app with a reward system. It would reward users for not crossing at undesignated areas. The second device would be a wearable device that people would wear and would buzz when they get close to or when they step into a road that was not an intersection. So the design that we finalized on is a system that uses LEDs <coughs> that are embedded in the curve. So it met all of our design requirements, and in addition to this, it provides instant feedback to pedestrians and drivers of any imminent danger. It also uses existing technologies that are prevalent in the market today, bring, and brings them together in an innovative way. This re makes it more cost effective and reducing the amount of money that would be needed to install it. It also has no compliance issues as it's not mounted directly onto the road itself, and rather is on the curb. This avoids any, any run-ins with any road rules or regulations. It's also able to operate in a wide range of temperatures and is completely weatherproof. It uses easy, it's easy to install as it uses existing installation methods and techniques, does, and it does not require any special tools or methods to get it to work. It, it's a motion sensing system. So it uses motion detectors to detect the position of vehicles and pedestrians. And using LED indicators, it's able to warn pedestrians if there is a car if approaching their position, so it stops them from walking onto the street. And in addition to this, it's able to warn drivers of any pedestrian that's about to step onto the street. They're all connected together, and, it's, and it uses a durable design that can last a long time. The construction is simple. It is just uh, it is a durable enclosure within um, and uh, includes an uh, LED and two sensors that will measure 180 degrees in range. So as you can see in the, in the video, uh, we were able to model a uh, working prototype of our product, and uh, as you can see. Uh, Spider-Man is trying to cross the street, and as soon as he steps on the street, um, it will trigger the uh, our system, and uh, the light will uh, the red flashing light will be on. So this is the second part of yeah. the, uh, the system. So uh, as soon as it detects a uh, a incoming vehicle, it will shine a blue light onto the street so that it will warn the pedestrians of any uh, uh, incoming vehicle out of sight. So the main question is, why us? What makes our product unique? As we already mentioned that, 76% of accidents happen in non-crosswalk areas. So our pro product actually focuses on non-crosswalk areas, because the current product in the market are for the safety at the crosswalks. And our product is so simple in nature that it actually solves more than one problem. The problems like blindsiding. You can see the person on the right and the driver on the left. Both are blindsided because of the red car, and they eventually get hit. If we use our system, we can prevent this. One more problem is carelessness. 
people often get distracted by their phones and leave the shopping carts which come on the road. If, if it's a cart, it's not that big problem. But if it's a baby stroller, that's a big problem. And our system can prevent that. And we are not just an app. If you have a phone, you don't have a phone. No matter what age you are, you will be saved. If you ha your country have a great internet connection, don't have it. You will be saved. So it's not just an app. It's cheaper than to current crosswalks. And it's e easy to install. We don't have to reinvent a new system. We can use the current installation methods and install it. So that's from our side. And it's time to save some lives. And thank you. Any questions? Thank you all very much. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Is there an audio aspect to this? Because again, you know, it's, it's a great idea. I like the concept, but as you said, if I'm looking at my phone, I'm not necessarily looking at lights there. Is there, you thought about adding an audio aspect to that? So the audio aspect, we, we considered that, and it could be part of design. The only problem is compliance. It might not comply with city standards. So that's why in this particular design, we're only using the light system. Okay. So uh, my question for you is, since the it lights up once you step out into the street, I presume that's what the way you described it, have you looked at reaction time? And if you're stepping out into the street and then the light goes on, it seems so, like it might be a little too late. So if you could explain that, that'd be great. So the light system doesn't, re <clears throat> doesn't react to when the pedestrian steps on the street itself. Instead, we have, it set, we have the sensors set up on the curb and not on the actual street. So the pedestrian will not have actually stepped onto the street by the time that the system detects where the pedestrian is. If they get near the curb and they get to the edge, that's when the lights will come on. And in that case, even if they don't step onto the street, it's still allowing the driver to be aware of the pedestrian's presence. Oh, I can also add on to that. And so that's why we integrated it with the car sensor. And so the idea would be the blue LEDs, right, would light up, and we, we estimated about 150 feet in front of the car. Usually it's about uh, 25, 30 miles per hour in a city zone. And so what we were wanting to do is, one, allow a pedestrian to see if there was a car in front of them and within that reaction time, and that would be the, the no-go zone. And then for the pedestrian red LEDs that we showed in the video, those are mainly just to allow cars to just see them and they'll all be going slow. Um, and so then they can just see them from farther off if the blue LEDs aren't activated already. I'm curious uh, what consideration you guys gave from a maintenance perspective when you have a device that sticks up on a surface, particularly in areas where snow removal is an issue. Absolutely. Take it. So, for maintenance, you know, we're going to use an epoxy based thing so it's going to stick on the top of the curve, the epoxy based sealant. It's the same thing we use for the, the little um, reflectors in the middle of the road and those last for quite a long time. And the reason we have it so small is like we're worried about people just coming by and stepping on it or kicking it. So we're trying to keep it small, minimally obtrusive so it can stay there for a long time. And hopefully if it's um, clear plastic covering it will last for a bit. And also what's great about the design is that if one sensor or unit gets damaged, it's easily replaced within the system. It doesn't just cause a cascading failure. Kind of like Christmas lights, huh? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Parallel, <laughs> not serious. Yes. Then I, I have a question. Did you have a chance to actually try out any LED lights outside? My just concern is if I'm maybe driving and I wasn't anticipating LED lights, and I see an LED light pop up, I might be distracted and looking over in that direction instead of the person that might be walking across. Oh, um, so one LED that we wanted to model this over is LED road flares. And so that's already up to standards as far as not shining light, too bright of a light in a, in a driver's face, right? And so um, ideally we would use a system um, similar to that. Um, that would come with further testing, absolutely. Um, and then seeing what kind of brightness we can work with to still allow the driver to be indicative of a, of a pedestrian and not jolt them into making a mistake. Okay, judges, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Judges, 
I don't know how you're going to do this. I think you've got an incredibly difficult task in front of you. You've seen five. You've got five more to see. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, we'll be back at uh, 335. So 335. We'll be right back. Thank you very much.
Ready? All right. I want to welcome everyone online back uh, to the Invent for the Planet presentation. As you have seen, we've had five presentations and they're truly impressive. I also want to remind everyone that this has all been accomplished in 48 hours. And if you can imagine what has already been accomplished in 48 hours, when we allow our students to continue on and continue to develop it, they can truly change the world. So we're looking forward to being able to have and work with them as we go forward. So let's move on, move on with the next one. Our next presentation is Net Positive. For Net Positive, my name is Holly. I'm a senior in industrial engineering. I'm Nick, and I'm a sophomore in mechanical engineering. I'm Allison, I'm a senior in mechanical engineering. I'm Samyukta, I'm a sophomore in biomedical engineering. And I'm Evan, a computer science junior. I'm Rania, sophomore biomedical engineering. Before we tell you more about Net Positive, we're going to show you a quick video. Five point twenty five trillion pieces of plastic waste are choking our oceans, lakes, and rivers, and piling up on land, killing millions of marine animals each year, and poisoning our foods and drinking water. Stormwater drainage is the primary source of microplastics into our oceans, and once deposited into these oceans, there's no chance of retrieving them. So how can we resolve this horrifying damage to both humans and wildlife and keep our planet safe? Introducing Net Positive, an innovative solution to help stem the flow of microplastics into our oceans from these stormwater drains. Net Positive provides a versatile two-net system where a small net traps the larger plastics and the larger net traps the microplastics, which are both attached to a storm drain sewage pipe. Once collected, the microplastics are then sent to top research institutions to further the development of economic and environmental-friendly microplastic degradation. On top of already allocated municipal funding towards stormwater management, federal grants have allocated $500 million towards recycling programs and infrastructure, which can then be used to fund our solution in a cost-effective manner. With storm drain systems across the globe using this design, the solution to properly collecting and disposing microplastics will be net positive. We are microplastics. Microplastics are small pieces of plastic that are less than five millimeters in length. They come from things like the clothing you're wearing right now, the cars you drive every day, and the cities you live in. And the source of these microplastics the number one source comes from these stormwater drains that go directly into our oceans. And that is the source that we decided to focus on. Now, why are microplastics bad? Microplastics absorb toxins, they harm wildlife, and they block sunlight. And these can go directly into your water sources and your food. So, how many microplastics did you have last week? You had about a credit card's worth of microplastics just last week. So that's where net positive comes in. We come in and we're answering the question of how can we design a system that can remove and dispose of microplastics at the source, storm drains. And that leads into our five requirements. One, it needs to be economical. It needs to cost less than $10,000. Second, it needs to be able to contain microplastics for at least three months. This is to prolong our maintenance period. Next, we want to keep it isolated. No external energy input required. Fourth, we want to remove at least 70% of the microplastics that we filter. And finally, it needs to be able to withstand a velocity of water of 15 feet per second in case of flooding. That leads to our initial designs. We first wanted to focus on one source, the synthetic fibers. We thought of adding a filter module to laundry machines in order to prevent that water flow from going into the stormwater drains. However, we couldn't find a design that would be small enough or handle the flow of water from these laundry machines. Next, we wanted to focus on the large scale. We wanted to add these hairs to boats that would collect microplastics as the boats went along the ocean. However, this would slow down the boats and it would be hard to retrieve the microplastics after they were collected, which leads to our third design, which is our two net storm drain solution. So this design can be broken down into three major components. The first being a larger, finer mesh on the outside 
made of nylon, which is an extremely durable fabric and sheds many less fibers than any other fabric, making it ideal for this specific situation. As well as second, having a coarser mesh on the inside that will be able to capture the bigger plastics that you can see like water bottles in these water sources and prevent them from entering into that second layer which will be primarily capturing microplastics. Lastly, it will be easily attachable and detachable using a metal collar of sorts that can be um, used to remove and clean out these uh, mesh layers whenever maintenance is required. And so in order to simulate a similar environment and test out our um, innovative solution, we wanted to build a prototype as you can see here. So we modeled our storm drainage exit using a PVC pipe with clean water on one side after we filtered out through our two-net system and the dirty water with microplastics uh, simulated using glitter and then larger plastics on the other side. And so in this video here, you can see our setup. We used compressed air on one side to simulate flow through into our netting on the other side. And here's kind of our dirty water with microplastics as well as larger plastics. So here you can see the water flowing through and the plastics being captured on the other side in our two net system. So the second net captures those smaller plastics, which is glitter in this case. And so after we removed them, first we removed the finer mesh to test this nylon fabric. And as you can see, it was able to maintain um, those smaller particles while still allowing water to flow through. And then lastly, we removed the coarser mesh and it was able to capture those larger pieces. One of the key aspects of net positive is the implementation of the cross-flow cross filtration technique. Cross-flow filtration technique allows water to pass parallel through the filtration net. Uh, as seen here in the diagram, uh, this technique allows more and more microplastics to become captured in this net. Even in times of heavy rain, this filtration technique prevents water cloggage or even high flood. This technique has also been implemented in nets that only capture larger plastics in places like Australia, and we are enhancing this method into our two-net system. Our two-net system, as stated earlier, comprises of a smaller net, which captures larger plastics, and a larger net that captures microplastics. This net increases the surface area to allow and maximize the capture of microplastics in this net. There's also a small gap between the smaller plastic and the larger plastic to allow or to prevent damage that the larger plastics could cause the uh, to the larger net and also prevent any loss of microplastics that have collected in the larger net. There are also current urban planning methods and uh, infrastructure in place like EPA and Water Act that specifically dedicate fund to implement uh, storage drain, storm drains. And going on into our disposal methods, once these microplastics are collected, they're then transported to research institutions that are currently conducting research in the areas of uh, microplastic degradation and disposal efforts like um, bacteria, plastic eating bacteria, and uh, our disposal and collection efforts can expand uh, research in areas of microplastic degradation and disposal efforts across the world. Now going into our larger plastic, uh, we, have con we will continue to include local municipal governments that will come into these storm drains collect all these larger plastic, and then take them to already systems that they have in place like recycle centers and sorting facilities. Now on to our cost. For our cost, we use the business model canvas to estimate it to be about $850. And to have a sustainable business, we decided to sell our product for $1,700. Cities such as San Diego spend about $760,000 on storm waste management. So there is a market for this type of product and the Clean Water Act is also a federal reg regulation that is used to reduce pollutants in water. Uh, that includes microplastics. We want to work closely with the local governments so that there can be awareness to microplastics and help them integrate our solution into their system. Our next step is to incorporate nanocoils into our design in order to make it more sustainable and eco-friendly as nanocoils interact with, the, um, interact with the microplastics and cause it to degrade into carbon dioxide and water. We would also like to partner with Excel Lifestyle, um, a sustainable clothing brand that manufactures um, fabric using biodegradable subpoena cotton in order to come up, in order to develop a plastic-free outer net in order to make our design even more eco-friendly. 
Um, additionally, we'd like to establish a establish an efficient distribution method that will place the responsibility of shipping these microplastics out to research facilities and universities on the local governments. Join us in cleaning up our oceans and cl collecting microplastics and destroying them, and together we can be net positive. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much, net positive. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I had a question. Uh, there was a $900 maintenance cost. I was curious what went into the maintenance and then sort of if you can tie that into my second question, which is it seems like there's a lot of transportation taking place. You have to take the nets, transport them, clean them out, and eventually you're going to have nanocoils that can uh, decompose the plastic into carbon dioxide and other things. I'm concerned about is this creating greenhouse gases or uh, is there, you know, are you trading off microplastics for other potentially uh, non-green uh, results? Yeah, so the microplastics are actually very small. So we're actually, um, we're actually going to be able to like um, store these in a small enough place, right? While we're trying to figure out what to do with them. And then for the larger plastics, we, are going to be using the local infrastructure, such as the sorting facilities, to be able to uh, dispose of those. And the cost that went into it was, we, we found that a lot of places with the regular net use a crane and a construction crew to replace the nets about every four months. So that's where we got the $900 cost. And then going off your question about nanocoils, that's something that we really need to research into, see if there's actually that benefit there to use these nanocoils in our existing design. It's very new research, so very preliminary, but it's just a next step, a potential that we could look into. So I'm curious, you talked about the cost and the maintenance cost, but what about the cost avoidance for a city who has um, plastics and things fouling up their wastewater treatment plants and stuff. Is there a beneficial cost avoidance that your product brings to market? Yeah, so the, um, a lot of the, the waste that is also going out of the storm drains is also going into like lakes that are used for the wastewater. And we're hoping that this can reduce the cost in that aspect. And while the ocean is, um, is really not the responsibility of the local municipalities, uh, there have been efforts by conservative groups to, uh, to do something about it. And this is one of the solutions. Yeah, and so building off of that a little bit, um, ultimately in the end, when these microplastics and large plastics get into bodies of water, they impact all of the surrounding communities. And so ultimately, in the end, if they don't do anything about this, they're going to be paying a much larger price than that of simply installing these nets and keeping the waters clean. They're going to be paying health costs, um, food safety costs, water treatment costs, the, the list goes on. And so this is a very simple and cost-effective solution that provides a lot of value to these local communities, both short-term and long-term. Have you thought of alternative locations because these research institutes, I, I gotta believe, are gonna be quickly overcome with more, you know, they've got my, more microbes than they need for their study. Have you thought of other alternative sites of where you could ship these once, you, uh, you get, once a community gets them? Yeah, I'll take that one. So right now, there's a lack of research in North America on uh, microplastics. So we expect that in the next few years, there's going to be more universities joining in on this. And through um, research, we found that in retention ponds, they found about less than one gram of microplastics in there. So we feel like um, once we're starting off, we won't have uh, too much of too many uh, containers of microplastics. So we think we'll be okay in that aspect. Um, but we do understand that as a concern. Um, but we think that the research is gonna start picking up now uh, as we move into uh, more knowledge about microplastics. Is this like a, uh, a one size fits all or is it, um, you know, you have, a, you have a bigger size for a larger storm drain that has a heavier flow rate? Um, I was just curious. Um, so there, 
we're going to provide multiple sizes for different storm drains, and we want to work with the local communities so that we can retrofit our product to their size. So it's the, the microplastic um, problem is something that's new and something that we want to be able to work with the communities with. And net positive, thank you very much. The next team up is Team Drift. Team Drip. Howdy guys, my name is Emily Ayub. I'm a junior ESET major. My name is Brandon Lipa. I'm a sophomore biomedical engineering major. My name is Rashal Saini. I'm a senior marine engineering major. My name is Kalpak Dabke. I'm a graduate mechanical engineer. My name is Cameron Costeja. I'm a freshman business honors major. And our product is JAWS. JAWS is removing plastic one bite at a time. A microplastic is a piece of plastic that is manufactured or fractured into a size that is five millimeters or smaller. They get into the ocean three primar primarily three ways. This is littering, when they are flushed down the drain, and when they are put into landfills and acted on by the weather. And we care about them because they are getting into the living tissues of oceanic organisms and now we are starting, we humans are starting to ingest them and we are becoming concerned with their carcinogenic and toxic effects. Lastly, our need statements. Our goal is to collect and remove microplastics from the ocean. So there are currently microplastic solutions out there. Um, one is this microplastic filtering buoy which is relies on the ocean currents passing through the device and it passively filters out the microplastics. However, this device suffers in that it's high maintenance. Um, you actually have to send divers out to remove the filters and get rid of the microplastics, or you could bring the entire device up to the surface to remove the plastic that way. Another way you could go is by using a net on a boat, uh, but this device is also high maintenance in that it needs to be actively pulled through the water and it needs to be actively monitored to prevent microorganisms and just sea life in general from getting caught in the net. Another way you could do it is by filtering the sand at the beach. Um, and this one is very labor intensive in that volunteers need to go and physically pick up shovels worth of sand and sieve it 
to remove the plastic and it's also not very efficient or effective at removing microplastics in that the microplastics are a similar size to sand granules. So following this market analysis and product benchmarking, uh, we decided on the following design requirements. Uh, the, the filter should be able to uh, process up to 50 gallons per meter, uh, 50 gallons per minute of uh, water. Uh, the filter should be replaceable and interchangeable in within, fi within five minutes. Uh, it should be low maintenance, meaning that the chamber or the collected plastic should be able to uh, be removed once a week. Most, and the most important point, uh, to minimize our um, environmental impact, we wanted to uh, prevent uh, sorry, animals which are smaller than five centimeters from getting in the system. And uh, finally, we wanted it to store up to five cubic feet of uh, plastic before it needs to be emptied. Following this um, guidelines, we, we came up with a couple of solutions. First one was to retrofit, retrofit filters to boats. Uh, another idea that we came up with was stopping microplastics at the source. So attacking the problem straight at the root. Uh, and the most complex one we came up with was having auto an autonomous craft uh, go around the ocean collecting deep sea waters. But our favorite idea, or the one we selected, our solution was um, involved an intermodular design which could be retrofitted onto a different range of applications, big or small. And our unique selling point about this product is that it's, it has a multi-state filtration meaning that um, you have progressive filtration of uh, different size trash, which are collected in separate different uh, compartments. After prototyping, we came up with two designs. One's meant for our large scale use, another one's meant for our small scale use. So for the small scale use, you can see it, it's made, uh, it's multicolored, and the large scale use is made of more of an aluminum material. So our small scale use device is 3D printed. We made it, um, so it can filter out smaller particulates instead of larger ones. So it's meant for a smaller scale use. But we also designed it just in case that there might be larger plastic pieces, it could also capture it and move it onto the side so the flow wouldn't be impeded. The, thing, uh, the major part about this is that it's modular. So between these sections, you have the filters and you can change the grade of these filters to make it as fine as you want it to without impeding the flow of the water. For the larger scale, we had it uh, where it could be attached to boats or exterior uh, devices and uh, you can have the water flowing through the movements. So we uh, made the initial diameter over here half an inch, the diameter in the middle over here uh, three eighths of an inch, and this fine, uh, this finer one for microplastics is uh, two millimeters long. So this allows it to have a multi-filter process and then you can take care of it and toss the plastic or recycle. So uh, for our product specifications, we wanted to see what the cost of such a device would be. Since it has multi-uses, it can be scaled up or down based on its design. We decided to uh, utilize aluminum for the chassis and uh, think about the materials such as filters that could be used, which will be provided by the user, or you can use the ones that come with the device. And it narrowed down to be about $100. So. Um, this can further be modified and you, you can have multiple attachment points to attach to crafts or be used in pipelines and based upon that the prices will be adjusted. So the first application that we thought of was boats. You can put this on the side of boats. As the boat goes it will filter out the plastic and leave the water there. Next one we came up with was in households. If you put it in the pipe for the washing machine, microplastics that come from the nylon and the polyester will be filtered out before it reaches any drains. And then next was runoff outlets, uh, storm drains, and industrial pipelines. Any plastics and microplastics coming through there would be filtered through this before they reach the ocean. The first option in the market that we considered was local employment in developing countries. Fishermen in those countries could attach this to the side of their boat. Uh, they would then go out in the water near their fish stocks. It would clean the plastics from their fish stocks so their fish wouldn't be digesting microplastics and in turn we wouldn't be digesting those. This would serve as a form of social entrepreneurship for them so they'd be able to help their environment and their community. Another marketing strategy we want to employ is actually contacting large scale corporations like oil and gas companies, uh, petrochemical industries, or even large uh, shipping vessels or uh, cruise ship companies because these are the primary uh, perpetrators of this, of this uh, trash that is being produced. And working, the main idea is to work with their corporate social responsibility teams to help provide an active solution and a unique opportunity to help uh, eradicate the waste that they produce. 
In the future, we'd like to include a turtle excluding device, which would allow any animal that is trapped to allow to use its body weight to be removed from the device to activate a trap door. Additionally, we'd like to improve our hydrodynamics. This has been JAWS. Thank you guys for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Jim Griff. Um, judges, you have five minutes for questions. So, with the removal of plastic, how, where does this go? What, how do you deal with this? This goes to a lot of different applications. Where is the next step in it? This seems like a, a multi-stage filter is a, a feasible idea, but then you have to have people that take the filter apart, replace it, and put the plastic somewhere. What's the next step in the process? Yeah. Uh, what we were thinking is our company, we're more worried about collecting it because that's the big problem right now. We would love to connect uh, the fishermen, people we help out, with a way to dispose of this. So recycling plants, uh, we looked at a couple companies in uh, developing countries that are taking recycled plastics and making them into new things um, for that surrounding community and providing jobs. Uh, so something like that will work great. We also looked at uh, recycling microplastics to make 3D printing filament. Uh, so those are all options on the table. What is your primary focus for your product, the United States or the rest of the world? Um, I feel like, uh, so our business model takes care of both of those situations. Uh, local empowerment would be more prevalent in uh, developing nations and uh, approaching the large corporations for um, CSR funds would be in more in the developed countries. Yeah. yeah, you need to make sure, again, United States, there's probably a lot of facilities that can handle uh, it was already asked about, you know, okay, now you've got this another product, now what do I do? But some of these developing countries there, that's going to be a little very problematic, so you'll need to check that one out also. I'm curious, uh, did y'all see any examples of, of similar concepts already um, out there? And, and if so, what makes, um, what makes yours unique? Um, so one of the solutions that was already proposed is uh, the one where um, it, there are already existing buoys which are being worked on, which do the similar kind of uh, work that the product does, except that that requires a lot of um, like manpower and has a lot of, it comes with a lot of assumptions. What we really wanted to do was something, it was like a one solution fits all. Uh, we wanted it to be retrofitted, so uh, it's kind of robust in the way that uh, it's, everything is replaceable. And uh, the learning curve should be uh, is very small, uh, and um, the solutions that are offered now uh, they're very labor intensive in the sense that, like how uh, um, Brandon said, that you either need scuba divers to go down and pick them up, or you need uh, to bring them up to the surface. So you have that time where it doesn't work. In this case, it's like a con continuous process. Whenever the uh, boat is um, like anchored, that time uh, you could just take them off as part of your normal maintenance routine. All right, Team Drip, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Howdy, my name is Aisha Abushena. Howdy, my name is Akil. My name is Megan Dawkins. Hello, I'm David. Hi, I'm Allison. Hi, I'm Priyanka. We're Team Plastique. So, a minute and think of all of the disposable uh, forks, spoons, plates, um, serving utensils, serving trays, stirrers, straws, we've used just this past weekend. 
what was that, about six meals and uh, a lot of trash from our snacks. Um, doesn't seem like much, right? Or does it? Well, I'll just leave it at that. So uh, while we think about that, let me share an interesting fact. We produce about 300 million tons of plastic each year, and out of which almost half is used to produce items such as spoons, forks, uh, knives, etc. Things that you know we might have used as a part of our meal once and disposed of immediately, not really knowing where it actually ends up later. So we as a team are focusing on the need to eliminate single-use plastics. So now, what are single-use plastics? So as the name suggests, they're products made of plastic that are used once and disposed of immediately. And why is it so popular? The simple reason is because it's convenient and inexpensive. So these are some of the you know, examples of single-use plastics, like bags, straws, some plastic cups, etc. Now, what is the real problem with all of this? The main problem here is, despite production, only a small percentage of all of these single-use plastics are actually recycled. Most of it just ends up damaging the environment and harming all wildlife. So with our solution, we aim to tackle all of these issues. All right, let's take a look where we've started. Two days ago, we all picked in the afternoon a topic we are all very excited about. We wanted to solve a board problem. So we've designed a list of you know, five, uh, six, uh, requirements that we knew that if we meet will surely you know help the world in a uh, very significant way in the next day and a half we've iterated over 60 different designs and uh, you know ideas we went from custom materials for plastics made out of seaweed we uh, looked into you know transforming the used plastic into filament for 3d printing we uh, looked into systems for uh, packaging more efficiently, packages during transport. We even uh, looked at uh, having our own grocery store uh, that would not be using uh, plastic or the single-use plastic. Well, we then realized we have to take a step back and look into the future. From the beginning of time, Food has brought us together by the handful, by the hundreds, and the thousands. We built markets and restaurants to gather around places with all kinds of smells and flavors. Sweet, sour, savory, and wondrous. Until every city, town, and village had a place where we dined together. Thousands of years in, the way we eat has changed, but our need to come together remains. This new era of dining needs a new place to gather, a place where your future is safe, a place where you and everyone you know and everyone they know all work together to reduce our ecological footprint. A place where everyone cares to reuse and recycle. A place that's bettering our future. This is Plastique. So, welcome to Plastique. We're pretty excited about this. We are proposing a solution that can target university campuses, hospitals, malls, company camp campuses, anywhere that has dining facilities, that we will make 100% single-use plastic free. So we'll be working first at a place where there's currently 12,000 tons of waste produced each year, right here in Aguiland. We'll be working with the university to ban single-use plastics on our campus. We'll partner with the Office of Sustainability, apply for grants like those from the Aggie Green Fund, and work with our food vendors on campus like Chartwell and like uh, PepsiCo to implement a new system that incentivizes the use of reusable goods like the ones you see here on campus. So what if people don't already have their own uh, fork and spoon and knife to go around campus? Well now, 
Every time a student enters Aggie Land for the first time at their new student conference, they'll be given a spiel about the culture of sustainability that encompasses red ass Aggies. Um, when they come here, they'll be given a box of goodies. It looks just like this. We're calling it our sustainability box. That gives them everything they need to eat in College Station for four years without a single bit of single-use plastic. Not only that, but when they dine on campus, they'll be incentivized with some points that they can earn every time they bring their own utensils, bring their own to-go box or coffee mug. And when they come on campus, if they, if they bring these, they can get points that are redeemable at local restaurants, say to get 50% off your Jimmy John sandwich or buy one, get one, uh, entree at Fiata. If they don't bring their goodies, that's still okay because there's a possibility to buy some biodegradable plastics or reusable coffee mugs um, for some small but not insignificant value, say 50 cents for some utensils or something. All right. So not only will we be incentivizing on-campus vendors, our app will help point users to eco-friendly companies in nearby areas as well. And they can still access the reward system on the app as described before. Now, a great thing, a great feature about our app is the maps. And so within maps, users are able to easily locate some water filling stations nearby, as well as uh, some sustainable and eco-friendly restaurants and companies and grocery stores as well as nearby. And most importantly, areas to recycle. Now, with our platform app, with partnerships with other local companies and other larger companies, companies can use our platform for space for advertising as well as helping to promote new deals and offers that are specific to our user. So it's a very friendly user face, interface, and yeah. All right, so besides the map, our app is also going to be able to be integrated easily into already functioning platforms in order to be able to target different kinds of industries. We're gonna have different uh, components of the app, including a My Locations tab, which is gonna show you the, all the different locations and places where events that are gonna come near you providing our services. We're also gonna have a My News tab, which is gonna show you all the different articles and information regarding how you can work on reducing your carbon footprint at an easier way. We're also gonna have a My Account tab dealing with the basics of your account and your point system. Now, our sustainability box is going to make it easy for even the busiest of college students to get everything they need without using any single-use plastics. They're going to be able to use these tools in order to use our services, and therefore, instead of going to go buy stuff, they already have everything provided. We're going to help them get what they need. So we plan to implement this plastic system at A&M first to test out the model. Once we verify the dynamics of the system, we plan to then extend it to other organizations like cafeterias and hospitals and malls, schools and other company campuses, other universities as well, to help them become a 100% single-use plastic-free society. Practicing sustainability is definitely not easy. And we have to overcome this uh, challenge by working together. And we all know that when Aggies commit, we really do. So Texas A&M has an obligation to support their students in adopting a sustainable lifestyle. The important thing to remember here is we are 70,000 of us. And if we go out with a mindset of sustainability, imagine the impact we can make on our future generations. Now is the time and here is the place to show that Aggies care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Nice speech. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Have you thought about the health and sanitation issue of now this as opposed to the safety of use, the one use? This, although yes, it, it does cut down the one use, but uh, the health and safety, I think, could be an issue there. Have you thought about that as a potential problem? You, you eliminate one problem, but now you potentially create another one. So when it comes to utensils and like your to-go box and such, I actually do carry these around and I can just wash them in between classes or I take them home. But oftentimes when you talk about food industry, you're not allowed to give them a water bottle to take behind the counter for that exact purpose. Right. So that's something we're gonna have to work with 
the vendors on campus to deal with. But this is all, this is a similar. I mean, I don't know about this particular system, but similar ideas have been implemented at other universities, and they've been able to work around it. Can you talk for a minute about the cost? So, what does it cost to implement the solution? What are cost savings it might offset the initial cost of the solution? So, the current amount of waste that we have or that we spend on single-use plastics is not a number that we can get in large part because even though it looks like we recycle around campus and there's a lot of recycling bins, if you ever talk to the custodial staff, they'll tell you that they put it all in the same place. Um, so I, I don't know how we could determine how much plastic we actually have as opposed to like other kinds of garbage. Um, when it comes to cost, probably we will be very in the negative when we first do it um, at a and campus. And that is something we'll have to work with our uh, partnerships and see what are ways that they think, hey, we've seen this done better somehow in another place, how can we uh, offset the cost? So not really sure on numbers yet. Probably very negative first. But don't be afraid. Uh, like that, uh, that, right, that, that's not the point. We are building here a brand, and then everybody wants to be part of our brand because that's the way the future, right? Kind of plan uh, or following up on the cost there, for these uh, food vendors, uh, most of these individuals have a very low margin to begin with. And so now you're asking them to add another cost, i.e. I've got to sell you uh, product, uh, silverware, cups, whatever the case. And so how do I you know, get that back? Because again, because of my margins, I think can't necessarily raise all those prices. Have you thought about how you go and incentivize it for uh, those food vendors? They, they actually get the money from it. So they're already providing your silverware usually, or your box, but now they can just charge you for it. Okay. And to add on to that, uh, the incentives just motivate the students to go to these restaurants and places that they wouldn't have otherwise gone, or they would just be more motivated because now they have all these rewards and credit. So just incentive for them to go spend a little more money. I'm curious again with, with cost related. Have y'all thought about um, like when a, when a student were to I guess, um, sign up for their new student conference. If they wanted to, to pay for this themselves versus having it um, be from grant money or something that the university provides um, as a way to be, you know, do your part and be sustainable. That's a great idea that we've not thought about. And then uh, for this, I was curious uh, with your research, have you seen different programs that have done something similar or, or are you thinking about you know packaging together this product and you know making that a sellable product that you could go out where i mean i presume that the primary innovation is the the reusable package i believe, I believe the university of british columbia the students gathered a petition together to simply ban all single use um, plastics and so initially they got the whole petition through and now all of the University of British Columbia does ban that and it really affected all the array, array areas surrounding it. So us being a large student body, it really does impact like daily usage and then us being the students behind it. This is definitely more of like a social campaign and stuff because there are definitely many ways to solve so many problems within like single use plastics. Yeah. Okay, Plastique, thank you so thank much. You. Present Team EasyVac. Howdy. 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 We are EasyVac. Today we are presenting to you a solution, an easy to use 
efficient and innovative solution to tackle mass evacuation procedures. My name is Rashank Chanu and I'm a freshman general engineer. Howdy, my name is Arthur Fornsworth. I am also a freshman general engineer. Hello, my name is David Ortega. I'm a junior computer engineer. Hi, my name is Gaurav Bala. I'm a sophomore computer engineer. Hi, my name is Aubrey Vanda and I'm a civil engineer junior. Howdy, my name is Shalala Fatunde and I'm a mechatronics junior. Howdy, my name is Wan Yu Liao and I'm an electrical engineer junior. Now on to our video. 13 miles and it took 15 hours to do that so predictably people ran out of gas and when they ran out of gas they had no air conditioning and then suddenly in 100 degree heat you've got heat exhaustion as a problem and in the end of the 120 people that were killed by Rita 100 of them were killed by the evacuation unfortunately. In the last two decades alone 2.3 billion people have either been displaced have lost their lives or have been economically decimated by floods worldwide. Hurricane Harvey brought forth the largest flood ever recorded in Texas state history, destroying over $10 billion in roads, bridges, highways, businesses, and the region's energy complex. But what is even more important is the loss of 88 lives, with the majority of them due to the inefficient evacuation protocol put in place. How can we capitalize on current technologies to develop a more efficient protocol to help citizens evacuate safely and connect them with their loved ones? Introducing EasyVac, the ultimate disaster evacuation method that safely and efficiently evacuates citizens. Our app implements four interactive features consisting of a map that displays your location and your path to safety. Family status allows users to connect with their loved ones. The report accident feature allows users to send status updates on specific routes. And finally, the web search engine allows users to see updates in real time. With our interactive solution, we are enhancing communication, giving users the latest updates and connecting them with their loved ones. So the problem that we're facing is that current ineffective evacuations cause many individuals uh, in the areas of disasters to be subject to time-consuming evacuation routes and with the lack of prompt situational awareness. So with this goal in mind, we, our team and I, we developed three, uh, five design requirements. The first is that the user must access a map-based software so that they can track their location as well as the route, the desired route that they would like to go for the evacuation. Next, the ability to, con to track and contact loved ones in the state of emergency is very crucial because the, our first instinct in a state of emergency is we want to be able to contact family members and loved ones. Next, push notifications and real-time updates must be, uh, must be sub transmitted to the user. For example, if there's an evacuation route closed, we must provide them a different route and let them know that that route is closed. Next, users should be able to report updates through the app. For example, in Waze, we see this through indicating that a, there's a police officer ahead or there's a vehicle accident on the shoulder ahead. Next, and most importantly, this app must be able to work offline because cell phone towers can go down in the, in the evacuations, and this is something that we, is very crucial. So current approaches that we use are FEMA, Exodus, like model simulation, as well as SNS project, or the SNS project, which is a magnet satellite, satellite system. Uh, FEMA procedures um, do have the, um, all three, the common place between all three of these is that they have the lack of ability to track and contact loved ones. Um, however, Exodus model and the CNN pro or CNS project both uh, do not work offline. We came up with three designs, two of them being the RC car system and the drone system. The RC car system would go to an intersection and put barricades, creating four lanes, uh, two lanes to four lanes. And the drone system would do the similar aspect, but a little faster. However, both of them had a major cost issue, which is why we decided to ditch this for the moment. In order to solve the problems with our initial design, we designed the EasyVac app. The EasyVac app uses the Google's map, Google Map API to show an interactive map that guides an individual to the nearest emergency evacuation shelter. The app also allows individuals to track loved ones by showing their locations in the app. 
An important aspect is that it also uses real-time data and from user from other users and from reliable databases such as FEMA to optimize the safety and speed of the individual going to the nearest evacuation shelter. And users can also report accidents on the app to ensure that others can also take the most optimal route to the nearest evacuation shelter. And the most important factor is that the, the app is able to work offline by sending a screenshot of the Google Maps route with the, to the uh, nearest evacuation shelter through the use of the Tulio API. This is the, the app that users are going to see when they're using our app. So on the left, that's, as you can see on the home screen, there's only four buttons on it, so it makes the user really easy to use. And on the middle screen, it shows the evacuation route. So on top of that, there's a Google map that shows the route for the user to go to the closest shelter. And on the, under the Google map, there's a word description that gives the user the direction to the shelter. And the word description can update like in the real time. So it can be up to date. And on the bottom, there are three buttons. So the user is, can go to the page really easily, just one click away. On the right, there's a, oh, on the right of last page, there was a report accident page. So user can report the accident, and also they can call for help and text, text the SOS message. And one of the most important feature of our lab, of our app is family status. So on the family status page, user can track and check their family status to see whether your family is safe at a shelter or on the way to a shelter or no response yet. And also, the user can get the detailed location of a family member simply by clicking the family member's icon so they can see where their family is at. And on the right screen, it shows the research internet search. So the user can use the internet search to research on weather or news about the accident. Now speaking of internet, the way that our app now, we want our app to work offline. So the way that we found a way to do this, as you can see in our live demo that we built, was that we used a combination of Tulio and Google Cloud technology. Tulio, which lets you send text messages to any Tulio number, and Google Cloud, which can also obviously grab data from things like Google Maps, allows us to use, create a free type of internet that allows us to basically grab a feature from Google Maps, which is API, and then send it back to the user as a text message our app interprets it. And this way, we can give users free access to internet for basic searching requirements, as well as giving governments, the um, municipalities, live data during emergencies. That way, people can use this app even during days where it's not a natural disaster, since they don't occur every single day, hopefully. And, and now, they have the ability to have this free internet app to help manage their data usage, which can ultimately let us use it here and also for places all over the world. So we plan to launch the EasyVac in three phases, but phase one occurring on a local scale where we'll essentially be selling our product to local governments and users can download for free with the sole purpose of large scale evacuations such as Aggie football games. Building upon this in phase two, we further sell our project to city governments around the world working, with school, um, working closely with school districts, companies to further implement our product into their current evacuation procedures. Lastly, our global impact will involve enhancing our technology to address different scenarios, such as implementing use of electronic displays, um, relay signals, and drone technologies to account for all citizens in an evacuation. Hundreds of thousands of people die each and every year because of inefficient evacuations, and our solution is tackling this, and it provides a brand new state-of-the-art solution that incorporates our current technology and provides a meaningful solution that can be used for governments and the users. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And we would like to now open the judging panel to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Easy Back. <laughs> and judges, you get five minutes for questions.
You mentioned uh, Aggie football weekend. Uh, have you thought about using that under a, relatively speaking, a low stress environment as a proof of concept? So for the Aggie football games, uh, low stress environment, uh, there was a problem about the 60,000 people that were in the Alabama game when Johnny Manziel was still here. That's why he brought it up. So that time, to get to your home, it took about two hours to three hours to just get out of the stadium. So now A&M uses this barricade system, which is why the drone system and the RC system came into place. But we decided that was cost, that was too much to cost. So now. This would help in in the case of now uh, we don't need those barricades. Now people could follow these routes out of A and M. So and we provide them with different evacuation routes in that one moment. Okay. So, uh, from a innovation standpoint, how would this, uh, from a route? going perspective be different than ways, let's say, that already looks at traffic patterns and tells you different ways to get somewhere? I love that question. The main difference that this one comes up to is how we are doing this on a way that allows, gives options to people who are on and offline. And Waze does not get to you does not use FEMA data in order to make their decisions. And more importantly, it can only be used by people who also have roaming data. But our tool works by using SMS messages to take Google Maps instructions and bring them to the user through a way that is for people who don't have access to mobile data or Wi-Fi where they're traveling. Yeah. Y'all mentioned, um, I think, one of the more novel um, aspects of your solution is the ability to, to contact your, your loved ones, your family. Um, However, on the, the, the offline capability, I, th I think I heard it was just a, like a screenshot of the, of the map itself. Um, how would you address uh, contacting your loved ones uh, offline? Sorry if you've already addressed that. I mean, I think you could already like send group messages offline. I don't think you need like data to send like group messages out through standard messaging. Yeah, we've noticed that a lot of people inside current exact in current disasters already would use SMS normally to communicate. So inside that emergency family slide, where you could see that you have the option to choose and find loved ones. We will give you the option to see where they are the last time they opened the app, as well as being as well as updating our image to show you where they are. So we can just quickly grab a new image from Google Maps, which we screenshot and then paste it to you so you see where they are. And this is for people without data, just to, without internet access, just to confirm. People who do have internet access would have access, will be able to use a Google Maps widget, which is in place of it. So I'm curious, does your solution integrate with um, county management systems around evacuation because one of the things that happens in most evacuations um, in Harris County is they actually don't have everybody evacuated at the same time it's staged so how would this potentially integrate with the county staging for evacuations when it, when it comes to that we do the way that our app does work is the idea that there's some monitor that is capable of being able to watch over and give these decisions. We have a base algorithm of where we expect people to go for the day of the event, thanks to FEMA data. But as, uh, as such, though, each of these routes would be pre-planned and ordained by the FEMA inspector or by whichever municipality instructors overseeing the evacuation. And at this time, currently, most governments are using things like Amber Alerts. However, what makes us different is we're not just providing them a warning, but we're providing them a route to go during emergencies like this. That is what makes our product stand out, because instead of making, giving people that warning, because most people don't evacuate during that time, the, that time frame they're given, and most people do end up waiting. And when they realize what the magnitude of the situation is, they tend to act at that time. So we have to give people a solution during that time especially. And so this actually provides real-time updates, and it uses the power of SMS messaging as well as the cloud API to do that. Okay, thank you for our team easy back.
Howdy, my name is Maite Coquino. I'm a freshman civil engineering major. Howdy, my name is Daniel Bersan, and I'm a junior electrical engineering major. Howdy, I'm Ignacio Galvan, and I'm a junior biological and agricultural engineer. Howdy, my name is Noah Huerta, and I'm a mechanical engineering sophomore. Howdy, my name is Suraj Alimi, electrical engineering graduate student. Howdy, my name is Neening Van, I'm a general and business major, freshman. Howdy, my name is Kushan, I'm a graduate student in mechanical engineering. So, any of you guys live under a rock? Anybody? No, right? So, probably everybody has so many electronic items plugged at your home. Did you guys know these electronic items steal money from you? Anybody hear that? <laughs> That's what we thought when we were coming here. The world is going to consume almost twice as much energy 30 years from now as it, as it does today. Over the past 40 years, we saw global population rise from 4 billion to 7 billion. That also led to 250% increase in electricity generation around the world. If you look at the projections for 2030, population is supposed to be 8 billion. The question is just how hard we should try, what pace we should go at it, and I, I think logically we should go as fast as we can. Would you close the faucet if the water was leaking? What if there was more than one? What if I were to tell you, just like dripping water, we are wasting electricity by leaving appliances on standby mode, even when they're not being used? This is called phantom energy. On average, in a U.S. household, this accounts for approximately 10% of your electricity bill per month. This is costing the United States alone $6 billion per year. Let's stop wasting our energy and make a difference now. As the human population keeps to increasing, so does the demand for energy. However, in order to find the ideal solution, we need to be mindful of how we take this approach and all of its environmental impacts. And why why is energy so important? Why do people like Bill Gates put billions and billions of dollars in order to create more energy? It's because it's estimated that for 2050 we're gonna we're gonna need 50 more and 50 percent more energy that we're using right now, and we're not ready for that. So to solve this problem, we look into three different solutions. Our first option was to find a way to generate more energy to change the way energy is transferred, or to increase, well, to reduce the energy consumption. One friend of mine, he, 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 he owns a solar panel installation business, and he told me that, like, surprisingly, a lot of people that have solar panels, they consume more energy than what they used to consume, because they thought, because they're generating a lot of energy, now they can leave the AC on more time, they can leave the lights on more time. So that's why we are sure that reducing the energy consumption is a key point to solve this, demand, this problem. This is a physical representation, a visual representation of practical electronics that all of us may have in our household. And here it's separated into two, two different categories. The dark blue is indicated for normal outlet electric consumption, and the light blue is for the phantom energy consumption. So the majority of the graph is consistent of light blue which indicates that that is the majority of electric consumption in the daily households. For example, all of us may compose of just these four simple items alone. These four simple items alone accumulate to 113 watts, which can increase your light bill per month by at least $7.50. That is money that can be saved and going into your pockets for better expenses. So when we were looking at designing a solution, we just we identified five key requirements. Our first requirement is that we wanted to be autonomous. We didn't want any user input necessary in order to make the device function. We also wanted a payback period of less than two years. We wanted easy installation of less than an hour with limited knowledge. We also wanted this system to be able to communicate live with the data so that it's able to become more efficient in a household. And then the last one, that we wanted to reduce phantom electricity by 50% or greater. So our solution, 
So currently on the market, we have products, we have smart plugs. These smart plugs allow you to control your outlets remotely from your phone. And then another thing on the market, we have our smart meters. These smart meters allow you to see your energy consumption on your phone. But currently, there is no connection between these two. What our device is, it's a smart plug that you easily install onto your wall. It's able to access this data of your energy consumption and then turn off the outlets accordingly when it finds that the uh, current input was, has decreased, so it's going to put out less current to reduce the amount of energy of vampires. So here, we are putting our prototype into test to prove just that. These are two separate outlets. The one on the right is the general outlet. The one on the left is our personalized adapter outlet. So the function of our outlet is that it detects amperage differences and takes action on the electronics in order for the electronics to reduce current. So as you can see now, in the beginning, both LEDs were bright blue. And now the, the one on the right is on standby mode because it is apparently off, but there's still electricity flowing through it. And all those, all those seconds and minutes add up. But as you can see with our design, that LED is dimmed to nearly off, meaning that it is very effective in optimizing electric consumption. What if you'd like to control this device away from home? So we, have to, we created an app that can also um, connect to your, the device and you can control this med box from, from anywhere. So first thing, you have to connect, obviously, the med box to the electrical outlet, download the med app, and connect to Wi-Fi. With time, this will start to study trends in, and also the behavior of your devices at home in order to tell you which one is wasting their energy and which one is not. And that way, you can control it from anywhere. So typically, when the conversation shifts to money, the atmosphere becomes tense. But however, I assure you guys, that's not the case. The average homeowners spend around $200 a month on electricity bills. However, what if I told you meds can save you around $200 a year on your electric bill due to uh, minimizing the amount of phantom energy? So each of our meds smart plugs has cost around $30 each. And after installing all the smart plugs, you would save around $16 a month on your, on your energy bill. And adding up all the savings in about one to two years, the savings for the electric bill will pay for the meds product itself. So after about a two year period, you would be getting a $20 paycheck in your mail, essentially. The costs clearly underweigh the benefits and the benefits for this are clearly evident. Thinking about the future, we would like to control more receptacles. We would like to be involved in industries as well as, and not just residential homes. So moving forward, our device can be integrated into electrical panels whereby more receptacles and more devices can be controlled and energy consumption can reduce. We will also like to integrate machine learning so people, um, so th we can understand the behavior of our, our devices at home. And we'll also like to train people on how to use our device and expand to non-OECD countries. All right, so you guys must be wondering how we're gonna kind of uh, address the problem of ever increasing energy demand. So think about this. So we are reducing, let's say 100 watt per household. Think about a whole neighborhood. And now think about using our product in a commercial building or industrial building. We could save like thousands of kilowatt hours using our product. And this energy could be used somewhere else where the demand is required. By doing that, we are differing the requirement for additional <coughs> hydrocarbon power plants. And we are kind of buying more time to like improve and improve the efficiency and develop new technology to utilize uh, high, uh, renewable power sources. So, and remember, this, this technology is available right now. With the, with the uh, sufficient amount of funding, we could, uh, we could develop this product and make it available in the market within a year or so. And finally, we are here to save energy and make money for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Thank you, team meds, judges, five minutes. I have a, a question for you. Uh, you're talking about it being intelligent and using the internet. Do you have an idea of what the 
electrical utilization of having this device on top of your electrical outlets, you know, is it still a positive thing or? Right, so that's actually a really good point. So what we did first was we looked into these smart plugs because you don't want a smart plug that uses more electricity than the appliances, right? So these smart plugs use a very negligible amount of the electricity that actually goes into these things. So we based it off of these smart plugs and adjusted our numbers slightly to increase for advanced logic inside the components. And that would, that would satisfy our goal of decreasing phantom electricity by more than 50%. Not all of the phantom electricity would be reduced because of some of it that would go into the logic, but a large portion of it that wouldn't be reduced normally will not be reduced. So often when you look into the devices that are drawing the phantom power, it's because they have to keep a sensing circuit on for some other purpose. For example, anything that's got a remote control, there's got to be a low level of current so that when you push the power button on the remote control, the device actually turns on. Um, so have you looked at ways that you could overcome that need? Because if, if there were another way to keep that sensing current alive, um, you wouldn't need all that phantom power. So, right. So let's see. One indication of, uh, like, one modern indication of, like, say, you're, we are at home is your phone is connected to your Wi-Fi, right? So we could, we are, we are thinking of ways like that could, once you're connected to your Wi-Fi, that means you're home. So you could like imp, kind of like increase the power uh, to the those electrical items and keep them in like more like standby mode. But what when nobody's like kind of connected to your Wi-Fi, that means nobody's at home. Even you forget about like turning it off our device would cut down the power and save energy. Can I add to that? Like, just think about the that you're building. After 12 p.m., there's not a lot of people in the rooms. There's like 12 TVs per room. So that would be a lot of money that's being wasted. They don't need the sensor to be on. With no delay, it's instantaneously fixing the problem. Right. In, in uh, hotels in Europe in particular, a lot of times, you have to put the key in somewhere in order to just flip on all the power. And when you take the key out, everything completely shuts off. Right. Um, do you see this as being something similar to that, but hooked into your phone or something like that? So when you leave, the things that can be turned off do get turned off? Yes. Like, as was, I was saying, like, when you leave the house, it disconnects from your Wi-Fi, which could be an indication nobody's home, so shut down everything. Or, like, not shut down, but reduce that. Shut down the things yeah. that you select that are right. vampires. And also, with time, the, the, the device studies the behavior of your appliances and gets smarter and starts to um, act, take decisions based on the behavior of the appliances that you have at home. And it, also, it can also set goals on the device, so it gives you an alert um, to let you know if you're ex exceeding your consumption and you can manage it from there, from, your, from the app. You think this is... Uh an ideal that the energy companies would be willing to uh, incentivize their customers? So actually, we thought about that a lot because obviously they're in the business of selling energy, right? That's how they make money, right? But energy demands are gonna be growing for the next, how, next 50, 100, 200 years. And energy companies at this date, they're not ready for that. All this infrastructure, power lines and such that have to be generated in order to keep up with this demand, they're not in a state to be able to produce this easily. So by doing this, by reducing the energy consumption in homes, it's allowing them to be able to produce energy for more, more homes and expand to more customers. Thank you. And also, depending on the business model of the utility company, would determine whether or not they would like to buy into our products. But nowadays, whereby companies are we're looking to save money for their customers, we believe lots of energy companies that would like to save money for their customers will buy into our idea. Team Meds, thank you very much for ending up the competition. Oh, judges, you now have a task ahead of you. I have no clue how you're going to complete this because you have just witnessed 10 outstanding presentations from students who have been working for the last 45 hours to solve some of the globe's biggest problems. Students, while the judges are doing their deliberation, what we're going to ask you to do is to go outside by the steps. We're going to take a quick group shot, and we'll be right back and announce the winners.
Thank you very much.
All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back. Um, the judges have had a uh, very difficult time trying to collect all the scores and put everything together. But it is uh, time for us to be able to award the first, second, and third place. I do want to remind y'all, particularly those of you in the room, that each and every one of you is welcome to take your project forward. We would love to engage you in the incubator. It is very impressive what you've been able to accomplish in a very short period of time of 48 hours. I know you've spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, and we worked with you, and we really were impressed with you as a group going together. Now, the next team, the first place team, has the opportunity to compete on a global scale. So let's get through the awards first. Let's go, well, and I want to mention one other thing. Uh, we'll talk about this. Is at, During the global competition, we'll have a People's Choice Award um, for one of the teams who comes. So one of the other first place teams who might not have been the top five will come here, and they'll have a showcase in the, on April uh, 1st inside the atrium here. I would encourage you to come and see the global teams and to be able to welcome them to Texas A&M University because it's a unique opportunity for you to see students from around the world. All right, so for the third place team and a winner of $500 and Andrew is going to prevent the, present the check. Oh, by the way, even though it's signed by Dean Banks, it's not cashable. <laughs> All right, so take your pictures with it and uh, get an opportunity to uh, take your pictures. Uh, the money will be placed in your student accounts as that's how we'll do it. <coughs> so the third place team and $500 to the team goes to City Seeds. Congratulations, City Seed. Don't walk around with that. Take the check with you. All right, and the uh, second place team is going to be checks going to be presented by uh, Dr. John Fry from Hewlett Packard Enterprises, and the second place team is Aerostainable. with it but I mean I need it back we're gonna no no eventually eventually we're gonna recycle this we don't want to create any single-use plastics here right all right and the final team the first place team and this is the team that's going to represent Texas A&M University in the global competition and we'll be working with you to continue to work on your uh, product as we move forward and this is a team that's going to be presented by Roland Block um, myself and um, Mark Johnson, because Mark and I are classmates, but we're going to be representing Texas a and University. The first place team is Ecotory. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. Good job. Congratulations. 
<laughs> All right, congratulations, Ecotori. Let me remind you to fill out the survey, please, and uh, we'll be around. You can take pictures. Please be sure that you have survey. Turn in anything that you take you've got from the EDC so that we can uh, uh, make sure that that's fine. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your competition and participation. In April, we'll be holding another, another uh, Aggies event. It's going to be sponsored by Facebook. So if you're interested, it'll be another interesting time for us to get together. Thank you again. Y'all have a great rest of the weekend. And remember, school starts tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>